And uh, I think this may have been motivated by the fact that it just seems like winter isn't ending, right? I don't know about you guys, uh, but the title to the message is Hanging On When Life Seems Impossible. Hanging on when life seems impossible. And we're going to be looking at the life of David. We're kind of moving through 1 Samuel. We're seeing King David here. And, you know, I don't think we often, we think of David maybe uh, with the sling in his hand and defeating Goliath, right? This, this moment of great, great victory. And that's a good way to think of David. Maybe you think of David as, as you fast forward into 1 Samuel and then really into 2 Samuel as now reigning as the king of Israel. And that's a good way to think of David as well. Maybe you think of David out in the sheepfolds, right? Ministering to and taking care of the sheep and writing these psalms to the Lord and worshiping his God. Once again, that's a great way to think of David. But tonight in chapter 20, and especially as we go into chapter 21 next week, you know, we're going to see David really running for his life. And guys, sincerely, we're going to see King David, and we don't think of him like this, this man after God's own heart, but we're going to see King David really resorting to some tactics of the flesh. We're going to see King David kind of doing things the way the world does them. And we're going to see him really just struggling to believe God, the promises that God has made made him. We're going to see him really struggling in that. Um, But we're going to see what God does and how God keeps us. And how God wants to. So, hanging on when life seems impossible, 1 Samuel chapter 20. Before we dive in, let's settle our hearts, let's pray, let's ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word. Father, tonight I thank You for Your Word. God, thank You that, Lord, for so many years now, just line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Lord, how You, by Your Spirit, transform people simply by the renewing of their minds. As your word gets in us, Lord, as Paul told Timothy, he said, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. And that there will be a time where men will no longer endure sound doctrine. So Lord, we thank you that that there still are men that want to learn your word. God's people still want to grow in the grace of, and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, even tonight. So Lord, honor your word in our lives tonight. As it's sown into us, may it produce good fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, guys, have your Bibles open too. You know, get into the word. That's where the blessing comes from. So we're going to pick it up, 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're going to pick it up in verse 24 tonight. We just looked at, uh, on Sunday, uh, we talked about uh, Jonathan and David. What does a real friend look like? If you weren't here for that, I encourage you, you can listen to that message online. Um, But now we're kind of diving right into it. David is on the run. Uh, Saul, is his heart is bent against David, and we looked at that on Sunday. But we're going to pick it up in verse 24 tonight. It says, Then David hid in the field. If you have your pen, you could circle that, hid in the field. We talked about it on Sunday. It's by the stone ezel, the stone ezel. That word ezel, the stone, literally means the rock that shows the way. So David is trying to cling to the Lord in the midst of this. He's hiding in the field, and it says, And when the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat the feast. Verse 25, Now the king sat on his seat, as at other times, on a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by David's side. Now, now guys, listen. If you have your pen, circle that Abner. We're going to see Abner throughout 1 Samuel. I mean, this is a mighty warrior. You know, in a, in a few verses, we're going to see David's going to really discover for sure that Saul wants to kill him and his mind isn't going to change. And I got a picture as David's running, he's less afraid of Saul and probably more afraid of this guy, Abner, because he knows Abner knows what he's doing. This is a real man's man. This is a military minded man. Uh, this is a warrior. And Abner uh, was sitting by, uh, we see there, Saul's side, but David's place was empty at the table. Verse 26, Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought, something has happened to him. He is unclean. Surely he is unclean. Now listen, if you're taking note, the first principle we're going to see here this evening, hanging on when life seems impossible, number, number one is, if you want to hang on, you need to learn to believe the best. You need to learn to believe the best. Now, 
you know, I don't need a show of hands. But in a group like ours, you know, there's different types of people. You know, there's the one type of person that sees the glass, the glass that's got the water in it. You know what I'm talking about. And you see the glass is half empty, right? It's halfway full, and you see it as half empty, some of you. Some of, some of us here, we look at the glass and go, wow, that glass is half full, right? You know, the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in the definition of love, it says that love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails, right? For David here, he's in the field. He's by this rock, Ezel, this rock that shows the way. And guys, I think it's once again a reminder to you and I, we have to learn to sit still long enough to, for God to do a work in us. You know, I have this, uh, this is a book by Charles Spurgeon, just a little excerpt from it. It's, it's to those that, that serve the Lord in some capacity. And at a Wednesday night here, most of you guys, you're not out here with five degree temperatures out, you know, just kind of muddling through your Christian experience. You probably want to serve the Lord. And he says this, uh, Spurgeon says this, among all the formative influences which go to make up a man honored of God in the ministry, I know of none more mighty than his own familiarity with the mercy seat. He's speaking of the presence of God. All that a college course can do for a student is coarse and external compared with the spiritual and delicate refinement obtained by communion with God. While the unformed minister is revolving upon the wheel of preparation, prayer is the tool of the great potter by which he molds the vessel. All our libraries and studies are mere emptiness compared with our closets. We grow, we wax mighty, we prevail in private prayer, Spurgeon tells us. See, David was on the run. He's not even fully there mentally. Like, he's really struggling here, guys. And yet he still would wait there by this place, waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord, waiting on God. But Saul, he's sitting at the table, and, and I think you see it here, verse 26, Saul jumps to conclusions. If you're taking note, Saul assumes, assumes. Now, I'm not going to tell you what that means, but I remember one of my first bosses when I was in the business field, he said, Bill, don't assume, because if you assume, you make a blank about you and me. That's what he said. I'm not going to say what it was. You guys fill it in. If you're not sure, ask one of the older folks here. They'll tell you what that phrase goes. But it's so true. It's so true. You have to learn not to assume things. You know, David here, he's waiting. He's on the run because of Saul. But Saul now assumes. And what does Saul assume? He doesn't assume David is praying, seeking the Lord, serving God, right? Add some conquest to, 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 to defeat the enemies of Israel. Saul assumes that David's not there because he's unclean. What does that mean? The idea is Saul says the reason why David's not here because he was probably out sinning. He was out sinning. He was doing something wrong. That's why he's not here. He assumes. He assumes. It's not good to assume, guys. You know, spirit-filled, Bible-believing Christians resist the temptation to jump to conclusions. And can I say something? It is a temptation. You might say, well, pastor, you're just different than me. No, I'm not. The only difference is I probably, <laughs> it's probably a greater temptation for me than for you. But it's a temptation, nevertheless, to rather than wait on the Lord to fill in the blanks and say, well, the reason why he or she did this was because, dun, 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 right? For what? So you can destroy a friendship, a relationship, no, it's best not to assume. It's best to trust God. Now listen, there are times <laughs> when people prove your assumption, and that's a little different situation. But for you, be careful. You know, first off, here for Saul, and it's a perfect example for us, it wasn't true. It was not true. David wasn't out sinning, was he? David wasn't at the local Jerusalem bar drinking, you know, missing out on this. That's not what was happening here. David was waiting on the Lord. Second, we often, I think, can think like Saul. You know, we can say, if I'm unclean, I cannot come. But nothing can be further from the truth. You see, that, that was Saul's thought process. Saul's thought process was, David can't come because he's unclean. 
When you and I start thinking like that, like, man, I would have gone to church, but you don't know this past week I did this. You're missing it. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. No, we come because we're unclean. The truth of the matter is, even when we think we're clean, little secret, we're not. We're not. Why? Because we walk in this world, you know? Even the guys that, uh, you know, in the Catholic days that would go to these monasteries and they would seek the Lord, you know, you read their diaries, man, they say sin would find them. <laughs> you know, they hadn't seen a human being for months, hadn't spoken a word for months, and they'd say sin would find me. It'd come in my mind, in my heart. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. You can't get away from it because it's not outside of you, it's inside of you. We're unclean, but that's why we come. You know, I remember years ago, I went away on a fishing trip with some guys, and uh, I remember I caught this big bass. And you know, we caught the bass. This might seem redundant, but we caught the fish, right? Got in, it was so big, we kept it. One of the guys was like, we gotta eat this thing. I said, all right. I actually happened to be the one that caught it. <laughs> so I was like, oh, we should keep my fish. It's the biggest. So, you know, he caught it. Then what we did was we brought it in the boat. This is going to be shocking to you. We brought it back to the docks. When we got to the dock, that's where we filleted it on the dock. We filleted it there. We had to catch it first and we filleted it. Then we brought it in the house. Then we washed it, right? We put it into the water, washed it. Then we seasoned it. Then we fried it up and then we ate it. It was good. You're going, I know that process. Yeah, I think we know it, but we forget it often. I think we think in the Christian experience is totally different, right? Like, you know, you got to catch the fish before you fillet the fish. Now you got to fillet the fish before you wash the fish. You got to wash the fish before you season the fish. You got to season the fish before you cook the fish. And then the Lord eats us, you know? <laughs> and then we enjoy him. We spend time. But let that process play out. Don't short circuit it. And don't, don't be so discouraged. You know, I just encourage you guys. Don't be so discouraged. But for David here, he's waiting on the Lord Saul is not believing the best of him, but actually assuming about him and probably telling other people too that David was unclean, though it was all fictional in David, uh, Saul's mind. Verse 27, let's continue. Chapter 20. It says, uh, And it happened the next day, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan his son, Why has the son of Jesse not come to eat, either yesterday or today? Verse 28, so Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem. Now this is interesting because Jonathan is not telling the truth, but we'll come back to this. Verse 29, and he said, please let me go for our family has a sacrifice in the city and my brother has commanded me to be there. So now Jonathan's like telling an elaborate story here. And now, if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. Verse 30, then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan. And he said to him, and I think this is probably, if you read it in the Hebrew, it, it looks like basically Saul's cursing at Jonathan here. You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame? And the shame of your mother's nakedness. I mean, why do you got to bring the, the guy's mother into it, right? You know, that's, that's how things go when people get angry. Verse 31. For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. Now therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Now it, it almost seems like if you've been with us, right, and we're studying through 1 Samuel, it's like, my gosh, like we get the point, Saul. You don't like David, right? We get it. But Jonathan, he's kind of sticking around. You know, Jonathan loves David, but Jonathan also is honoring his father. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting how he deals with this. If you're taking note, it's number two, hanging on when life seems impossible. Number two is you need to learn how to choose wisely. You have to learn how to choose wisely, uh, especially as you're growing in your walk with the Lord, right? You know, when you're kind of just a problem and, you're a brand new Christian and you, you don't know which way is up or which way is down or what's good food, what's bad food, or, you know, you, you really don't even know how to tie your shoelaces yet. There's not really a lot of opportunities to choose anything. You know, you're kind of just a baby being dragged around. But what's interesting in modern Christianity, you know, if you listen to the Christian radio and such, there's just so many things, you know, just so much stuff. It's kind of crazy. 
And it's almost hard to, de to determine what's important. If you're taking note, jot this down. Christianity from beginning to end is based on one thing, priority. That's the deal, man. Like if you want to be effective in your Christian experience, you have to learn one simple thing, priority. You know, I'm not even saying you can't be involved in many things. That's fine. But if you don't learn priority, you, you'll kind of always just wander. You'll just be another guy that just goes everywhere. You know, it's, it's interesting when you read in Ephesians 4, you know, Paul there talks about the church and, you know, he's given some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. But then he goes on to explain what's the purpose of this. And he says, the purpose is that you may no longer be children tossed to and fro with every what? Wind of doctrine. In today's, a lot of in today's Christian experience, we actually want to go, I, I remember there was a song. It was very well known. It was, which way does the wind blow? Because that's the way I want to go. And I remember hearing it going, I don't think we ever read Ephesians 4, you know. Hey, we don't want to go the way the wind blows. We want to be rooted and grounded in God's word. At least that's what Jesus said. That's what the Bible says. For Jonathan here, this was a tough thing. You know, he's, he's with his dad. His dad now realizes the second new moon feast, David's not here. He asks his son, and you know, I don't care how loony the dad is. At this point, I think genuinely, if, if Saul was around in our day, I think he would be heavily medicated. Seriously. I think he may have been, you know, put into some sort of, psychological program. I think Saul was legitimately off. You know, I think they would have possibly diagnosed him with some sort of schizophrenia. One moment he'd be like, I love David. The next moment he's trying to kill him, right? And it, was, it wasn't an act, it was real. But, but Jonathan, he's still kind of bearing with him. Now, no, but no matter how messed up a father gets, I think he knows when his kid is lying to him, you know? I, I kind of love it, you know, when my kids and they're here, so I don't want to say too much. But, you know, I love it when they start telling me a story because I'm ruthless, Father, you know. Like, I will know they're lying, and I will actually, oh, really? Wow. Tell me more, you know. And they'll continue, wow. What else happened? And it just gets more silly, you know. It just gets weirder and weirder. At the end of it, I'm going, I know all that was baloney. You know, I know. And you just kind of know, you know. And sometimes you, you let it go, and you just wait for them to tell you the truth. You know, and that's an interesting thing. I think even Saul here, he knew Jonathan was, was not telling the truth. And, and can I say this? Though what Saul was doing was so much worse than what Jonathan did, I don't think Jonathan needed to do this. We're going to see David in the next chapter is going to do some of these same things. And the amazing thing was they're still going to have suffering. There's still going to be difficulty. And God's still going to deliver them out of these things. He's still going to take care of them. But they didn't have to do this. They didn't have to resort to the flesh. They could have just said, you know, he could have said, Dad, you're trying to kill the guy. He's not here. You know, big wonder why. Because he doesn't want to die, Dad. You know, that's why. But he didn't. He told him this long story. But regardless of it, it didn't change the bitterness, envy, and violence that filled Saul's heart, guys. You know, that, that's where things get tricky. Guys, the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence. You know, often, sometimes, you know, we see this take place, like when, when, when our hearts get filled with all this bitterness or anger or jealousies or lusts or vile things, and, and rather than coming to the cross of Jesus Christ where we can be made well, you know, we, we, we choose not to do that. Well, there's only really one other option for us, and it's to begin to blame everyone else. That's it. It's the only other option. To be able to, well, the reason why my heart's filled with envy and bitterness and lust and anger and violence, it's your fault, you know. And now we become a problem. That's what Saul does. That's what Saul does here. There's a problem in him, and it's David's fault. Now there's a problem in him, and it's what? Now it's Jonathan's fault. Whoever's around him, it's going to be their fault. And at some point, the Lord's going to really corner Saul and help him to realize. But it says... And Saul says it himself, he says, you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame, he says to his son, Jonathan. And you know what? It was true. It was true. It was true. Jonathan, though he was, it's kind of interesting because Jonathan's still honoring Saul, right? He's sitting in his court. He's still listening to his father. He's trying to be honoring. But he has, 
in his heart made a discerning decision to say, you know what, dad, you're trying to kill David. All he wants to do is bless you. Yeah, I have chosen to try to keep David alive and to keep you from murdering him. Yes, that's true. I'm guilty. You know, if you're taking note, jot it down. It's Amos chapter three, verse three. Very good verse to remember. And I think sometimes we can forget this today because we live in a very difficult age when it comes to truth, conviction, doing the right thing. Amos 3.3, 3, it says, Can two walk together less, unless they are agreed? You know, it's a tough thing because we, we live in a hyper finger pointing world, right? It's like a hyper though. I, I think it's always been a part of human nature, but it's a hyper finger pointing world. And I, I don't know if you ever heard this. If not, I'm about to do you a huge favor. You know, anytime somebody's pointing one finger, there's three fingers pointing back at you. Some of you guys are like, I know that. I, okay, maybe somebody didn't, but it's important. Usually the way I know who's guilty, I'm telling you a little secret here. This is a Wednesday night Bible study secret. You ready? Pastoring, training 101. You know how I usually know who's guilty? It's the one who's like this. That's how I usually know. How do I know? Because you're pointing one finger, there's three going back at you. I go, oh, there they go. You're the one. Because usually the one that's not guilty isn't so quick to be like, they did it, they did it. You know, it's, it's the human nature. David wasn't spreading, and Saul did this to me. And then Saul did this to me. David wasn't saying anything. David, the whole time, is sitting there by the rock that shows the way, praying. Saul's the one going, you son of a... And he's saying other words, you know. And it's interesting. Well, how do you... How do you what do you do, Christian? Well, Amos says, how can two walk together lest they be in agreement? You know, for you and I, we have to... You have to find believers you can walk with. If you want to follow Jesus and make it this side of heaven, you need to find believers that you can walk with. You must. We talked about it on Sunday. I'm not going to give the whole message again. But we're living in a day where man is tapping out and saying, you know what, it's so much easier to be alone. And I said this on Sunday. You're right. It is easier to be alone. But the Bible says it is not better. It's not better. It's not better. It's better to grow and to develop relationships and endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and to learn how to be humble and do this thing together and share the gospel. Even Jesus said it, right? So plainly, Jesus was so wonderful at speaking to these issues. He says, the world will know you by your, what? Your love for one another, right? So, so, so important we catch that. Verse 32, so Saul's not too happy with Jonathan, but look what happens next here. Whenever somebody's really, really right, this is usually what happens. Verse 32, and Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and he said to him, he said, Dad, why should he be killed? He's talking about David. He says, Dad, why should David be killed? What has he done? Like, Dad, what has David done that was so bad that we should kill him? Verse 33, what did Saul do? this wonderful discussion he has here with his son. Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him. By which Jonathan knew. I wonder how Jonathan knew at this point. <laughs> that it was determined by his father to kill David. Listen, if you're taking note, it's number three. Hanging on when life seems impossible. Number three is look for the pure and peaceable. Look for the pure and peaceable, man. Like, look for it. Look for it. Um, the body of Christ is in desperate, desperate need. Desperate need of discernment today. Desperate need. It is getting more and more convoluted by the day. And I say this with a sense of, you know, prayer, a sense of prayerfulness and, 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 uh, and desire to see the Holy Spirit move upon us. You know, I hear a lot of people saying we need a revival. And if you've been here for a while, I agree, we need a revival, but I have a message I gave many years ago. It says we need a re-Bible, a re-Bible, right? That's really what we need. When you study the Old Testament, when a genuine revival took place in Israel, you know what was always discovered first? It was the Word of God. You see, the answers that much of God's people are looking for have been right in front of their nose all along. They're right here. The Bible says it, my people perish for lack of knowledge. You know, but I want to ask you this, and it's Acts 17, 11, if you're taking a jot it down, it's the Bereans. We need to be Bereans, church. We really do. 
You know, like if you're here and you're like, I know my Bible so well, and that's your attitude, you probably don't know the Bible that well. I'm just going to say that. Because if you know the Bible really well, you know what your thought process is? Man, I barely know this thing at all. You know, because uh, yeah, truly that's it. You know, if you're, if you're studying the Word, you're realizing, wow. And, and can I say this too? If you have a sixth grade reading level, sixth grade, now I know that's probably three or four grades more than mine, but uh, you know, if you have a sixth grade reading level, you can understand this book. That's a lie the enemy put out many, many, you know, generations ago. This book was written so you could learn it. And it's knowable. It's not, well, and I got you. You know, it's good God speaks to us, but this book can be learned. That's what we do here at Calvary Chapel. We teach the Bible. That's what we do. This is our main thing here. Teach the Bible. And as you grow and you understand the Bible, if you have grown and you understand the Bible, I would anticipate your life has changed in the process. That's how this thing works. But have you ever seemingly been caught between two parties in a disagreement, right? I know... As a pastor, I find myself in this place quite regularly. How do you discern right from wrong? You know, I think it's a tough day. I remember I was, we were watching the Discovery Channel the other day. I don't know why. I'm a glutton for punishment, you know. And they have this, this new thing coming out. It's called The Story of God. One of my favorite actors, Morgan Freeman, right? I mean, this guy has got to be so anti-Jesus. It's not even funny. But I mean, he's got The Story of God. <laughs> there were some lines. And I'm just a glutton. I'm watching. I'm going... Oh, gosh, it's false, false, lie. lie. You know, it's just torture. But it was amazing how they're like panning this, this idea of all the religions of the world and how we all really believe the same thing. And I'm going, what? Like, that's the idea of the day. Even as I just said that, some of you here are going, man, Pastor Bill, I love you. Well, maybe you didn't say that part, but you should. But maybe you're, you're going, Pastor Bill, I love you, but you're so judgmental. It's not interesting. That's where they get the idea David was judging Saul and was against him. I'm not judgmental. I'm not the one that made Islam different than Christianity and made, you know, you know I'm not sure if you know this, but Hindus believe that the earth is on the back of a giant elephant. We've been out there, guys. We know that's not true. I'm sorry. I'm not anti-Hindu. It's just not true. But it's an interesting day we live in. It's a very difficult day. Uh, we're, we really have kind of checked out when it comes to objective truth. That truth is knowable, and it's not relative to what somebody may think or feel, but it's actually true. It's true. But how do you and I, in the real life situations, discover what part is right? You know, I remember there was a movement years ago, it was called WWJD. How many of you guys have been a Christian long enough to know WWJD, right? There's the bracelets. What would Jesus do? This is what I would recommend. When you're in a situation and you're not sure what to do, just think WDJD. What would Jonathan do, right? What would Jonathan, what does Jonathan do here? This is what Jonathan does, and I've used this before. If somebody's in a position where they're accusing someone else, ask them hard questions, right? Usually when somebody's accusing someone else, there's two things that are involved. There's intimidation, and there's emotion. In, in our society, unfortunately, the more intimidating or emotional somebody becomes, the more we go, oh, that must be true. When really we should be saying, if it's true, I can ask some difficult questions. And that's what Jonathan does. He looks at his dad, he goes, dad, what has David done? What has David done to deserve death? Like, do you have an objective thing that David did? Did David murder someone? Because I don't remember that, right? Did we have him up before the Sanhedrin on charges of murder? Because I don't remember that. He asked him, is there something objective? Now, what's interesting is when a party is lying or has ulterior motives and you ask them, man, I'm giving you all my pastoral secrets here. But you ask them an objective question and you challenge them, do you know how they respond basically every time? They attack you. That's what they do. That's exactly what happened with Jonathan. He says, Dad, what did David do to deserve death? Saul says, oh yeah? He's ready to kill him. If you're taking note, jot it down. James chapter 3. James 3, verse 13 through 18. It's one of my favorite verses when it comes to discernment. I'm not going to read the whole thing for the sake of time, but James there says, 
Wisdom that comes from above is first of all pure. It is peaceable. It is willing to, guess what? Yield. If it's really wisdom, it's not afraid to be questioned. It's afraid to go, maybe I am wrong here. Maybe I misunderstood this. Why don't you come and talk with me? I'm not talking with you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? I'll see you in heaven one day. <laughs> but that's how it goes. But wisdom that actually comes from God is pure, peaceable, willing to yield, bearing the peaceable fruits of righteousness. But what does Saul do? He erupts with emotion, ready to kill him. I'm so right, Jonathan. Against David, I'll kill you. I'm so right. <laughs> Good to see you, Dad, you know. But that's what happens here. It's probably a little more relatable than we'd like to, we wish it was. I know I wish it wasn't as relatable as it is. But let's move on. Verse 34. So Jonathan dodges his father's spear there. Verse 34. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger. Jonathan was upset. And he ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father, it says here, had treated him shamefully. Because Jonathan's not just there protecting David from being killed, but now he's listened to his dad defame Jonathan's, I mean, David's character. You know, his father Saul is literally openly saying, the reason why David's not here is because he's unclean. He sinned. He did this wrong thing. And the, the, the shocking thing to me, even in Israel thousands of years ago, there, was, there wasn't enough believers around them just to, to look Saul in the face and say, listen, I love you, Saul. I respect you as king. But what did David actually do? What was the thing that made him unclean? You know, I anticipate they were, the reason why they didn't ask because Saul had his hand on the javelin saying, David's unclean. You don't think so? You want to find out? You know, intimidation. But it's interesting here. But he was upset. Jonathan was grieved. He loved David. Verse 35. And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David and a little lad was with him. I like this. I don't know why my, eyes, my, my thoughts were brought to the little lad that was here. Then he said to his lad, Now run, find the arrows which I shoot. As the lad ran, he shot an arrow behind him. And when the lad had come to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? Now, if you remember from the first part of the chapter, this was kind of a code between David and Jonathan. David was going to wait there. And when Jonathan came back, if it was well with his father Saul, he was going to shoot the arrow and he was going to tell his little lad, his servant, the arrow is closer, come in. And that would mean to, to David, buddy, you can come home. But if he shot the arrow and he said out loud to, the, to his servant, listen, the arrow's farther, go. That would mean, David, you're going to have to flee. My dad is against you. And it wasn't just Saul that would be against him. It would be the entire government of Israel. It would be the entire army of Israel. You've got to remember, Saul at the time is the current king of Israel. This was serious. This was a life sentence. This was a change in your entire life. How you were thought of where you can live. If you're taking note, it's number four, uh, in terms of hanging on when life seems impossible. Number four is keep a servant's attitude. Keep a servant's attitude. You know, my eyes were drawn to this little, little lad that they keep talking about here. You know, David now, uh, you know, because he's waiting by this rock and he's, I'm sure in David's heart, he's probably claiming all the promises. You know, he's probably even speaking it. You know, he's like, I believe, Lord, that Saul's going to have a good idea towards me and I'm going to be fine and I'll be able to come home and live there. But as he waits by this rock, he discovers the Lord had another plan. And as he waits there, he finds out he is now an outlaw. David is an outlaw. That Saul is against him. The army would be hunting him down to kill him. He knows Abner. Remember, David was the general of the army at one point. So he knows the players here. He knows the capabilities. He knows the tenacity. You know, even to this day, the Israeli army is, you know, we send our, you know, you know, our Navy SEALs to learn a lot of things from them. They're so advanced. It's a serious thing. And David knows what this means. But it's interesting here, this little lad, I, I just was drawn to him as I, as I said it before. He was just a servant. And he was just doing 
what Jonathan had asked of him. He was being faithful. He's being, you know, truthful. And he, he had no idea at this moment what he was a part of. It wasn't like Jonathan sat him down and said, listen, the next king of Israel who's been anointed by Saul, who has the, the Messiah literally in the loins of his body, right? David is going to be Jesus's, you know, great, 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 great grandfather. You know, we're a part of keeping him alive right now. The servant had no idea what was going on here. He was just running out after an arrow. But in the midst of just being faithful with a little bit, literally his actions were part of determining the outcome of human history. You see that? Like what was happening here was Satan, through this carnal man Saul, was trying to kill David, who was part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And who does God use in part of it? I don't know what his name is, right? When we get to heaven, I don't know we'll even be able to find him. I don't know if it's going to say little lad on his forehead, you know. It was just a little lad. He was just doing what the master asked him to do. And, and you know what's amazing? I, when we read our Bibles, I think often we think of ourselves like David or Jonathan. But I think if we were honest, we're more like the little lad, you know. Like most of us, that's our part to play. We're just servants. You know, Jesus, Luke 17, Luke 17, verse 10 and I know this, this isn't something that's talked about much in modern Christianity. But Jesus said, so likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. You know, Jesus doesn't say, after you've done it, we're going to have a party with trumpets. And we're going to, you obeyed in one thing. <laughs> what? You know, now listen, I know I'm being a little sarcastic here, but that's not the attitude behind it. It's not. Even in 2019, guys, when you really get down to the nitty gritty and you hear from the people that are the most successful in life, you know what's amazing? They still don't make excuses. They still work hard. They still have actually sacrificed a lot to get where they were. It wasn't handed to them. Now, I know even my me saying that is like offensive to much of what we're hearing today. But even today, the people that are very successful, generally speaking, that's what they look like. And in God's kingdom, it's the same with the Lord. Like, guys, after we, you know, it's kind of a tough day to say this, but as we serve the Lord, it's not we're, we're doing this to help God, Right? Or I'm doing this, you know, I'm, I'm doing this to help the church, you know. It's like, ugh, you know, thank you. Thank you so much. And I do appreciate every, I do appreciate it. We appreciate it. But for your own good and your walk with the Lord, Jesus, when Jesus says something this plainly, it's usually good to take it at face value. After you've done it all, just say, Lord, man, truthfully, if, it was, if everything I've ever done in life were put on the scales, it wouldn't even be close. I'm just an unprofitable servant. And Lord, if what I did produced some fruit, wow, God, honestly, you get the glory because I was just doing what you told me to do. I just, I finally have figured this thing out. I'm a servant. You're the king. The better I am at obeying you, the better life is, man. It's better to be a servant in your house than to be anywhere else, Lord. And that's the right heart to have. That's the right place to be in. And for, for this little lad, he had no clue what, you, what he was a part of. I would say that to you today. At work, when you go to work and you say, I'm going to be the, the best, you know, Christ, the best employee I can possibly be for the glory of God, you might say, I don't know that it's having much effect on anyone. And maybe you won't get to see one individual come to know Christ. I don't know. Maybe you will. You know, I think the Lord probably would bless you like that. But I can tell you this, when you get to heaven, you'll see it a little differently. You'll go, wow, I didn't know this was my part. I didn't know that one moment, that one person that I ministered to, I didn't know who they were. You know, I didn't know the profound effect I had there. And the Lord didn't show you yet. But when you get to heaven, you'll see this little lad didn't, didn't know. Let's wrap it up. Verse, uh, verse 38 of chapter 20. He says this, and Jonathan cried out after the lad. And he said, make haste, hurry, do not delay. 
So Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came back to his master, verse 39. But the lad did not know anything, as I said earlier. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad and said to him, Go, carry them to the city. Verse 41, And as soon as the lad had gone, look at this, guys. David arose from a place toward the south. He fell on his face to the ground, and he bowed down three times, and they kissed one another, and they wept together. But David more so. Yeah, I bet. Because David, from this moment on, is going to be, as I said earlier, an outlaw. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, May the Lord be between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Listen, number five, hanging on when life seems impossible. Number five is hang on to God's promises, guys. Hang on to God's promises. You know, I think there's so many things in life that we get in our hands and we just will not let them go. You know, maybe it's a house or a job, right? Or a person, right? <laughs> you got this person, you're like, I won't let you go. And meanwhile, you're like strangling them to death. They're like, please just loosen your grip a little, you know? Maybe it's your kids. You could do the same with them, right? And we get them in our hand and we're like, I'm just not gonna let you go. This, this attitude is not a bad attitude. The question is, what is it that's in your hands that you will not let go of? You see, if you get God's promises if you learn what this book says, what God says to you, he says, I'm making you a promise and you hang on to it with all your might. I, I can tell you this up until in, in this point in my walk with the Lord, God has never, not one time broken one of his promises to me. Never. I've been in many occasions where I was, when I'm saying hanging on to the promise, I'm talking, it was like a hair tendril. You know, it's like, oh gosh. But he never did. Never. I, I've been there but never. But I don't know that I've ever been where David is here. You know, I think it's important as we wrap up that you understand where is David? As we move into chapter 21, where is this man after God's own heart? Where is this man who was a young boy and took out a giant named Goliath? Where is this man that is going to go on to be the next king of Israel? Where is this man that is a man after God's heart that wrote this, the hymnal of Israel, the book of Psalms. Where is this man at this time? As I said earlier, David is an outlaw. And you have to understand, from this moment on, throughout Scripture, Jonathan and David, these close friends, will never see each other again. They never will see each other again. Like, David knew sorrow, man. He knew pain. You know, even for Jonathan, he was, he was willing to ste step out in faith and believe God, but there was consequence attached to that, man. You know, sometimes in order to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I love you, but, but no, what's happening here is wrong, I'm sorry. And I'm not trying to be judgmental, but that's the deal. Sometimes that costs you something. It costs Jonathan, it costs David. They will never see each other again from this moment on. And what a good friend Jonathan was throughout all this time. David now would be going into the lowest point in his life. You know, I know we want to think, all right, all that the Lord wants for us is to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And listen, I believe the God of the Bible wants to bless us. I believe he wants to bless you and bless me. He does. But there are times of preparation. There are situations that happen in our life that, guys, God didn't take a break from the throne and all of a sudden you accidentally staggered into this. I also want you to point out here, this has nothing to do with David's sin. This isn't David's sinned and he's moving into this season. That's not what's happening here. David is moving into one of the, it's going to be the lowest point in his life. And I can picture David here with tears falling from his face as he's bowing down to Jonathan, just basically saying, thank you. Even in the moment of the lowest point in his life, David still, you know, didn't take on a woe is me attitude, which is important. He was still very thankful. Though he was about to run, he, you know, if it was me, I might look at Jonathan and go, you should, be, you should be coming with me, you know? <laughs> like, I'm getting thrown out of this place. You know, I'm, a, I'm an outlaw. He has to go by himself. That was the season. That was the season. And it was important for David to go through this. And in David's heart, guys, you're going to see, especially into chapter 21, God's promises are going to be tested 
in David's heart and mind. Big time. Like David is going to let go of some of them, guys. There's going to be some things, guys, <laughs> David's going to go, I don't think you can do this. I mean, chapter 21 is crazy. It's almost like you think David went out of his mind or they have to be talking about another David. It can't be the David we know and love because he does some things that are just so uncharacteristic. And, and I think some of us here tonight, you might say, you know, Pastor, I, I hear you, but there's things that have happened in my life you just wouldn't understand. Some things that are happening in my life, you just don't understand. And I'm not saying I do understand, but I just want to tell you real quick, let's just recap what's happening in David's life. His home is gone. David has lost his home. The position he had is gone. His wife is gone. Some of you guys are like, well, no, I'm just kidding. That's not right. I shouldn't say that. My wife is gone. His mentor, Samuel, gone. His best friend, gone. His reputation, his reputation, David did nothing wrong. His reputation is gone. And now he's on the run. He's an outlaw. His, there's a bounty out basically on his life. This is where David is. Every single, as far as I can see, every single solid aspect of David's life is being shaken and removed. David knows the military force that will be hunting him. And we're going to see in the chapter 21, even David is going to resort to uh, the actions of the flesh. He's going to resort to lying. And I think the, the reason why, you know, and, I, and I, if you're taking note, you may want to jot this down, is, you know, one of the ways to stay sharp and to stay in your first love is remember, try to always remember, maybe write it down somewhere, try to always remember the greatest victory in your walk with the Lord that you've ever had in the kingdom so far. And remember how it was won. Like I, I think of David here, if he could have just remembered at this moment, wait a second, wait, wait, wait. I stood in front of a 10 foot giant. And what, what happened there is I said to him, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. But I come to you, what? In the name of the Lord of hosts. And even great David will forget this. He'll forget just for a little while though. You know, maybe you're here tonight and you've forgotten some of these things. Maybe you're clinging to some of the promises of God and you're going, I don't know if I can. Maybe you've let go of some of them. I love the Bible because it tells us the truth about all our heroes. And David is the hero of our heroes, okay? David is the hero of our heroes. Jesus will sit on the throne of David, the Bible says. But our hero of heroes forgot sometimes, let go sometimes. But David, you'll see later on, we're going to read chapter 21 and study it. And at the end of it, he'll finally come to a resting place and it's there he'll write many of the Psalms. And is there he'll, that's what's so wonderful about David, is even when he blew it, he would go into the presence of God and he would say, I blew it. I let go, Lord. My enemies, but God, you, you, God, you were a refuge from the storm, right? You were a shelter from my enemies. And I love it, right? Maybe that's you tonight. Listen, go back to the Lord. Let him refresh you. Hang on, guys. When life seems impossible, hang on to the promises of God. Hang on, man. Hang on. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Why don't we stay?